Our first topic on economic stability is deleveraging spirals, and is developed in two of our past papers. First, let's dig a little deeper into how risk absorption works in leverage-based stablecoins like DAI. This resembles a CDO structure where we have a portfolio of underlying assets, and we split this portfolio into two tranches, a junior tranche, which is intended to be more risky, and a senior tranche, which is intended to be less risky. And now if there's a loss that's incurred, uh, this is first borne by the junior tranche and the senior tranche is protected. Now relating back to stable coins, uh, the junior tranche is really these risk absorbers in the system, and the, the stable coin holders are meant to be the senior tranche. There's additionally the addition of this uh, deleveraging process, which essentially says if there's a large enough loss that's borne by this, uh, this system, then the system is automatically deleveraged and scaled down so that there's still enough extra, uh, extra room for protection for the, the stablecoin to be essentially a perpetual product. To, uh, we now want to model the, the price dynamics in these systems. And the original, uh, the motivation here is that the original die supply um, was determined entirely in, the, in this, this, this type of a leverage market. And it is uh, created by speculators who choose to borrow against ETH uh, to achieve leverage. And the market here has an endogenous stablecoin price. In particular, the supply needn't always equal demand at the, uh, the $1 price. And we really have to hope that uh, the incentives that are in place lead to maintenance of the peg. So we then develop stochastic models of what this endogenous stablecoin price actually looks like. And it leads to what we call deleveraging spirals, which cause short squeeze effects and amplify collateral drawdown in these systems and also lead to stable and unstable regions for these, uh, these stablecoin systems. To describe the model, let's focus on how the speculator in this model is, is making decisions. So they have a collateral constraint, which is over collateralization that's encoded uh, by the protocol. In particular, the value of the locked ETH uh, held by the speculator must be greater than or equal to a collateral factor times the uh, the stable coins that have been borrowed into existence by the speculator. And the speculator's decision is then to change the stable coin supply to maximize their uh, next period expected returns. So this is essentially deciding what is the issuance of this stable coin. And formally, this is uh, described in the problem here where the speculator's value process Y includes a liquidation effect. Uh, essentially, the protocol can liquidate the speculator's position and this has costs and market effects. In this model, we prove a series of formal results using some measure theoretic tools. Um, first, we show that the stablecoin has bounded or, or small probability of large deviations in its price in a certain region. And we call this region the stable region for the, the stablecoin. We also show that the stablecoin has bounded probability, again small, of large quadratic variation in this region. And here, quadratic variation describes a measure of the variation of the price process. And so in particular, with large probability, uh, the price process is not varying very much. And then we also show very different results uh, in what we characterize as an unstable region. So in particular, the stablecoin experiences a short squeeze or what we, what we call a deleveraging spiral uh, in this unstable region. And formally, the uh, uh, this, this unstable, uh, this deleveraging spiral is uh, characterized by sub martingale prices in the stablecoin, meaning that we expect the stablecoin price to increase actually in this setting. So let's walk through how this works. Here we visualize price, demand, uh, supply, and collateral value in this stablecoin system. And importantly, in equilibrium, we have that demand is equal to supply. And let's say that starts at a, a dollar price. So now, if there's a liquidation that's triggered in this system, because there's been an ETH price crash, say, then the system uses uh, some of the collateral to reduce the supply by essentially buying back the supply, uh, which causes a supply-demand imbalance. And this causes the price of the stablecoin to increase, and in turn, causes the demand to decrease, bringing it back in line with supply. 
But now, because there's been a price increase, if there's a further round of liquidations, actually the protocol has to use more collateral to reduce the supply uh, because the stablecoin price is higher, which causes the stablecoin price to go even yet higher uh, to bring the uh, demand back in balance uh, with supply. And this becomes a spiraling effect where we have uh, increasing prices and effectively uh, decreasing uh, value of collateral actually uh, being usable in this system and protecting the system. We can relate this process to an increase in variance as well. Uh, first, we show that an approximation of variance increases by an inverse square of the size of an ETH return shock. So in particular, this means that uh, a higher return shock causes much higher uh, variance increase uh, by this approximation in the stablecoin price. We make this more concrete by also showing formally that the unstable regime has distinctly higher forward-looking price variance uh, for the stablecoin compared to in the, uh, the stable regime. And in particular, this suggests that these stable and unstable regimes are, are well interpreted as such. This was then directly witnessed actually on Black Thursday in DAI in March 2020. And here, uh, Ether experienced a 50% drop within the day, uh, which triggered a large liquidation price effect on the DAI market, uh, causing the price of DAI to increase well over $1.10, despite the system actually being in, like, in an emergency setting here and in a less safe setting itself, uh, as well as inducing markedly higher volatility in the, in the DAI price at this time. And this implies some complications for, for non-custodial stablecoins that these, uh, these deleveraging pro problems exist. In particular, there's no stable region uh, in this model when the collateral price process is not a sub-Martingale. In particular, when people, uh, people really need to expect the collateral price is going to increase for, for the whole system incentives to work out properly. And this leads to a seeming contradiction here. The goal is really to make a decentralized stablecoin, but this can only be fully stabilized by adding uncorrelated assets, which at the moment are currently all custodial. And patching this has been a major topic since Black Thursday. Now, a few solutions have emerged uh, since Black Thursday, and uh, one of them is how Maker has tethered uh, their system to USDC and importing the corresponding custodial risks of USDC. So this has essentially been done by maintaining exchangeability of DAI one-to-one -one via USDC reserve. Uh, and this is termed their PEG stability module or PSM in DAI. And this has largely worked as intended in the, in the last crisis in May, as we can see here comparing the Black Thursday crisis in red to the crisis from this past May in blue. Uh, and seeing that the peg is now maintained much more tightly. However, it comes at a cost, and recently over 50% of the DAI supply has become backed solely by USDC in this way, which means that uh, there's correspondingly very large custodial risks actually in DAI. Another approach is taken by Rye, uh, which institutes negative rates on stablecoins during a crisis. So this means that if we're in a deleveraging spiral, now stablecoin holders are incentivized to sell their stablecoins or else they incur an insurance like, uh, like fee uh, due to the negative rate. And this leads to some further questions of what the equilibrium participation might be like in this system if, if rates are, for instance, expected to be negative for substantial periods of time, as well as questions of how liquid the stablecoin will actually be in different settings. Another approach, which, uh, which we've suggested actually in a paper before and which Liquidity essentially uses now is to develop uh, dedicated liquidity pools to help uh, absorb uh, deleveraging as it happens. And this has worked fairly well in the crisis uh, in, in Liquidity this past May. Uh, Liquidity allows direct redemptions, which we saw at the beginning of this crisis. But then the stability pool really absorbed the following deleveraging, as you can see, uh, in a way here that uh, effectively postpones and smooths the effect. Uh, one further solution is then to build uh, new reserve-backed primary markets, which we'll touch on a little, uh, a little bit further in the remaining parts of this presentation um, in how we've designed the new gyroscope mechanism.